All right. Hey, thanks again uh, for your time. Uh, this is actually part two of uh, my new series, and this is called Walking in the Prophetic. And you know, I just want to clarify, I ended the last video basically of what a false prophet is. And you know, it's very important that you have to understand and recognize the counterfeit before you recognize and understand the true. And I will give examples, I will name names of the true men and women of God that are out there that are really walking with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I ended the last video basically talking about a false prophet. And the, the direct definition of a false prophet, they deny the Bible is the Word of God, they uh, do not believe Jesus is the Christ, and they basically are motivated by lying, manipulation, lust, greed, power, and you know, they've, you know, Satan basically offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and the glory if uh, he would bow to him. So they're following the devil. Okay. Now, but there are false prophets in the body of Christ, and they do believe the Bible is the Word of God. They do believe Jesus is the Christ, and they do believe they're motivated correctly, and yet they're false. Now, you know, there are different degrees of deception in the body of Christ and uh, you know there are people that are called to be prophets but because of immaturity uh, maybe they've got just some major issues in the flesh and we all do so I mean I'm not you know claiming that I am outside of this I you know as I said I'm an evangelist I'm not called to be a prophet if God would allow that in the future I mean I would I believe that he would do that through a revelation of some kind and I uh, just wouldn't receive any revelation. Again, the Bible says even if an angel from heaven, you know, gives you another gospel than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, that it could come from a wrong source. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, who I truly believe walked in the office and ministry of a true New Testament prophet, uh, Jesus actually came to him and revealed to him. And he actually started out as a pastor, um, then he became a teacher, and then later he was called and commissioned to be a prophet. And he actually said that when the Lord told him that, that there was actually a time when he felt a, a mantle come upon him. He actually felt an anointing when his office changed of what God had called him to. And God allowed him to continue to pastor when he was a teacher, um, but he actually had become a teacher. Then when he began his teaching ministry, he was no longer really pastoring, even though, I mean, he still pastored to some degree, but I'm saying that anointing had changed. And then as he was doing his teaching ministry, God called him to the prophetic ministry as a true prophet with an office of a prophet, and then it changed again. And he actually sensed a different anointing. And the Lord came to him and spoke to him about certain things to understand uh, in relationship to demons, uh, just the demonic realm, um, how it functions and operates in the body of Christ. I mentioned another gentleman in my first video, Howard Pittman, was actually taken up to heaven and given a message. He actually stood before the very gate of heaven. He was a Baptist pastor for like 30 years. He thought when he would go before the throne of God, before the gate of heaven, you know, heaven would just rejoice and be like, oh my gosh, we've been want, waiting for you. You know, you are awesome. You know, come and behold the glory of the Lord. You know what I mean? Oh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But instead, he wasn't even allowed in heaven. He stood outside the gates of heaven, but the Lord, you know, basically gave him a revelation. And it literally changed his life because... He was just under an impression that the works that he was doing was approved by God, and God basically said they weren't. Now, it wasn't that he wasn't saved. He was saved. It's not that he wasn't loved by God. He was loved by God. But his call and commission was to bring a prophetic word from heaven. And so God gave him five revelations. One was that, and I don't remember the order, so I could be wrong. But uh, one was that we were the church of Laodicea. Now, in the book of Revelation, there were seven churches that were given, you know, that Jesus himself, the Bible says, you know, in the book of Revelation, the revelation that, you know, John was given, you know, that uh, God gave to Jesus, okay, and Jesus gave it to John, 
And this was a revelation to the seven churches that were at that time period. There were actually seven different churches, okay? And they were basically, you know, each candlesticks in a sense. You know, they shone the light of God on this darkened, you know, perverse nation, okay? And then there was a messenger, and it says angel, but it's actually, it's the word messenger. So it really probably means pastor. There was probably... Uh, an elder or an overseer or a pastor over each of those candle sticks that John saw in that vision. And not only was that literal at that time, but in the book of Revelation it says, uh, write of the things that are, the things that will be. So there, he was writing about things that presently were, okay, and then about things that were to come. And so, the seven churches were all in existence at that time, but then, if you study church history, you will see that each church uh, covered a certain period within church history. And now, God specifically told Howard Pittman when he was in heaven that we were the church of Laodicea, which shows the timeline is correct. The last church, you have, you know, uh, Sardis and, you know, Philadelphia and, you know, uh, all these different, you know, churches, and when it gets to the very last one, it's the church of Laodicea, and that's what God told Howard Pittman that we were. Well, the church of Laodicea basically is the one that was rebuked, you know, um, that, uh, you know, anyways, God wasn't real happy with all the ways of the Laodicean church. So if you want to read that, it's Revelations chapter 2 and 3. You can read the Revelations to the different churches. Anyways, so... Howard Pent was told that we were the church of Laodicea. The second the revelation he was given was that Satan is a personal devil. Now, number one, a lot of people don't believe the devil's real. Well, Howard Pittman was told by the Lord at the gate of heaven, okay? So heaven's real. The Lord spoke and gave five revelations from heaven, okay? So, I mean, if you don't believe in the devil, then you obviously don't believe that Howard Pittman was before the gate of God. You don't believe he was in heaven, and obviously you don't believe he's a personal devil because you don't believe he's real. Well, that's the revelation you have to understand, that if you don't believe he is real, then you've already been deceived by him. That personal devil in your life has convinced you that God is not real. Well, if God's not real, then of course the Bible is not real because if there is no God and there's no heaven, then there's no revelation of the God of heaven on this earth. And therefore, you can do what you want, when you want, how you want. There's no standard for life. You know, you just do whatever you want to do, hoping that everything's going to be okay, you know, when you die. You know, that's not how you live. And God says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and he says, choose life that both you and your children might live. So, the revelation of Howard Pittman. Number one, where the church of Laodicea. Number two, that Satan is a personal devil, meaning Satan is real, okay? Number three is that um, Jesus Christ would come back uh, in this generation. Now, I don't fully understand the entire revelation of that, okay? You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ, you know, even so come Lord Jesus. So I think the Apostle Paul thought Jesus was coming in his day. There's been people that received revelation throughout their lives that Jesus would come in their time and he never came. Now, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour, okay? And there was a guy, uh, he, you know, on May 21st, basically, of I think 2012, he basically told everybody that Jesus was coming back, and he, like, totally messed up. And he actually had to publicly apologize that he messed things up. But what I personally think may have happened was, is God was revealing to him that he's an older man, okay? He, he doesn't have a whole lot of years left to go on this planet. His name's uh, Harold Camping, okay? You can probably, you know, read about him on the internet. A lot of things written against him. But anyways... God may have revealed that this was his last opportunity to share the gospel because he would be with the Lord Jesus Christ soon, which I believe he will be. But he misinterpreted some things, thought it was the entire body of Christ, set a date, which you can't do. If you're a man of God, you cannot set a date for the rapture. I mean, how can we not learn that? A guy wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 88. He didn't come in 88. Somebody else, I think he rewrote another book that, you know, 89 Reasons Why Jesus 
will come in 89. He didn't come in 89. You know, you cannot set a date for the rapture. As soon as you do, you will become a false minister of the gospel because Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man, but the Father only. Now, the Father, I believe, will reveal the season but not the day and not the hour. And, you know, I don't think that he's going to go, I'm coming back this fall, okay? And I don't think he's even going to say, really, I'm coming back next year. I think that at the time, the corporate body of Christ is going to have such a sense in their spirit that he's coming back. And he does say he's coming as a thief at night, so I'm not saying that everyone's going to know, but the Bible says that even though to the world he's coming like a thief in the night, because it says when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, which sounds to me like the tribulation is going to come upon them when we're raptured and taken up to be with Jesus, you know, during the, uh, you know, marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, a lot of people disagree with that, and you can disagree agreeably in regard to the timing of the rapture, whether it's pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation, that does not make whether you're a Christian or not, okay? Whether you believe Christ came or is coming before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or after the tribulation does not change your state of who you are as a born-again child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and loved by the Lord. But it may change the way you view your world and the perspectives that you have. And so a lot of people, when they believed that they were going to go through the tribulation years ago, they stored up food, they did all these things, and they mistimed a lot of events. Even at the time of the end of 2012, some people perceived that that was going to be the start of the tribulation, and they did the same thing. There's a guy now saying that Christ is coming back next year. People are doing the same thing. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> saying the tribulation is starting next year, so they're already, you know. And so a lot of times we just, you know, we mess things up. Now, does it mean someone's a false prophet? It could, but mostly it means someone is an immature prophet. They misunderstood something. It doesn't mean they're not born again. It doesn't mean they're not a child of God. It doesn't mean they're even on their way to heaven. It just means they royally messed up the revelation that God gave them, and they really screwed things over. Okay, so when Howard Pittman was told um, that Christ would come in our generation, what that means, I don't know. Now, I was given a revelation, and I saw three generations stand before me. One group was like, uh, and this was uh, in 1980, excuse me, not 84, sorry about that. It was on, uh, uh, I'm trying to get the uh, date here, um, 2004, not 84, okay. So on uh, March 8th of 2004, I was given a revelation. I thought thought three generations before me, and then I was told that we were the last generation. But I saw three generations before me. So what that means to me is God saying, look, every generation has always been the last generation because Christ is going to come back in my generation because I'm going to die and I'm going to go to be with Jesus. You know, when you are, you know, when you are absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. When my children, you know, they're going to come to the place where they're going to die and they're going to be with the Lord. And my children's children are going to be with the Lord. When he's coming back, I don't know, but I know every generation has always been the last generation because we all only have one life to live and give for our Lord Jesus Christ. However, there will be a last generation that will see the coming of the Lord, and it is certainly possible it's our generation, it is certainly possible it's my children's generation, and it's certainly possible it's my children's children's generation, but all three could also be included because I could be, you know, a hundred years old. My children, okay, you understand what I'm saying? My children could be, you know, uh, 80 years old. Their children could be 60 years old. Their children could be 40. So, it I mean, it still could be our generation and it would include all the other revelations. So, it's all still possible. Um, I do believe God's going to give the world a very large opportunity to receive his son. God is not going to come back. Jesus is not going to come back tomorrow because it doesn't give an opportunity for enough people to be saved. Now, also, I don't believe, I've heard some people say, well, he won't come back tomorrow because God's not going to allow all those people to go to hell. Well, if he comes back tomorrow night, it's still possible, but then the tribulation would start. There's going to be a huge revival during the tribulation in which multitudes and multitudes are come to Jesus Christ. However, my personal opinion is 
that the the harvest and we're like in a 20 year cycle of a harvest time and that might just be the first harvest there might be many more but you know God is going to give this world an opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus Christ. I believe he's literally going to go to every nation, every people group, from the Satanists to the agnostics to the Illuminati to, you know what I mean, the, the, the Muslims to the Buddhists to the Hindu to the bowlers to the baseball players, you know what I mean, <laughs> to dog lovers, you know what I mean. He's going to cover every group of on this planet and give them an opportunity to say yes or no to his son. So I believe we're just in the in the early stages of the end time harvest. Anyways, so Howard Pittman was also told, okay, that we're in the second day of Noah. Now, Noah, I mean, here you go, God from heaven telling Howard Pittman that Noah was real, okay? So if you don't believe in Noah's ark, when God from heaven said Noah's real and called this the second day, and Jesus believed in Noah because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So when Jesus Christ does come back, the Bible says just like it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving marriage, they were building, they were planning, they were doing the normal everyday things when suddenly this flood came, this water came, and kept getting higher and higher and higher, which lifted up the ark, and the people were drowned. And uh, God, I'm sure, wanted people on there too, but all the animals made it. But the people, full of demons, rebellion, rejection, I mean, murder. Uh, the Bible says that man's thoughts were only evil continually in the time of Noah. And yet it says, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Anyway, so Howard Pittman was told that we're the second day of Noah. So there's four things I've told you. The fifth thing he was told was that God was a God of signs and wonders and that just like in the time of Elijah, that he was going to perform things in the last days. Well, as soon as God told Howard Pittman this, Howard Pittman turns around and inside his spirit, he didn't say it out loud, inside he said, I thought signs and wonders went away with the, with the apostles. Now he was raised a Baptist. Now is there anything wrong with a Baptist? No. Baptists are saved, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. They love God, but they mostly only teach the salvation message. They haven't gone on into fully understanding the revelation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the apostolic and prophetic ministry of the body of Christ. And it's not that, you know, God's not mad at any Baptists. No, my God, they are our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and they are awesome because they're saving people. But people that are getting saved, God's still trying to take them into deeper revelations of His Spirit and of His Word to understand things. So it's like a Rick Joyner is given a revelation of a mountain and the lower level, and it's not a bad level, it's the level in which people are brought to salvation. There were all these people out in this water. The waters were, you know, very dangerous waters. There's sharks in the waters. There's all kinds of things going on. And they are calling for help. They're dangerous waters. And the shoreline, basically all the Baptist brothers, were there pulling people up out of the water to bring them onto the safe shore of salvation, okay? So, but there are other levels on the mountain you can get to. There are higher levels of anointing. And he was shown one of the levels was Galatian 2.20. Well, there are 110 plugs, that's a certain level of power, and then there are 220. You know what I mean? And then 220 is a higher power source. And it, God, you know, there are cars out there that still work that you can roll up their windows, but there are also cars that have you know, windows that are automatic, that you press the button and they automatically go up. Both cars are real, both cars work, but it's different, a different level of uh, technology. Well, there's different levels of anointing in the body of Christ and there's different levels on that mountain. And the, the Baptist brothers should not despise, just like the eye should not say to the hand or the foot to the knee, I have no need of you because we are members in particular of one another. The Baptists have their part in the body of Christ as members in particular. The Charismatics have their part. The Pentecostals have their part. The Prosperity Movement have their part. The Healing Evangelists have their part. We are members of the body of Christ. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all come into the unity of faith under the knowledge of the Son of God, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right. Hey, I'm going to try to keep a little bit short. Uh, someone said, hey, you're making them too long and you're losing people 
attention, that don't know a lot of these things. So in the next video, I'm going to share a little more of Howard Pittman's revelation, um, what he heard before the throne of God. All right, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I get excited because this stuff is awesome. All right.